So, uh, good morning and uh, welcome everybody to my talk today. Uh, today I will talk about how to reproduce a Vigilion timer on browsers using PyScript. So first of all, uh, can you push up your, pull up your hand if you know what is Evergelion? Anyone know what is Evergelion? Okay, okay, I'm relieved. At least you know, some of you know what is Evergelion. So a bit of introduction about myself. My name is Scotty. I came from Hong Kong. I'm a speaker and also an organizing committee member of uh, PyCon Hong Kong. And uh, I will call myself a software developer. Uh, I'm actually now working in uh, a company called Sabit, which is a uh, IT solution company that I found with my founders. Uh, a little bit about my company, uh, Sabit. Uh, it is based in Hong Kong, and uh, we um, build a uh, customized uh, computer vision and AI solution for our customer. Our customer includes some like government organization, uh, railway operators, and lift and escalator companies. Um, by the way, we are hiring, so if you're interested to work in Hong Kong, please feel free to reach out to me and check out our website. Now today, uh, uh, we try to, the topic is Evergion Timer, uh, implement using PyScript. Um, so let's start. So the agenda, we'll first take a close look at the Evergion Timer design itself, and then um, I'll explain how to reproduce the graphical components. Then I'll talk about how to program it, and then we'll see what it looks like after putting them together, and, and then we'll discuss some of the lessons learned, okay? And the slides is that you can get it from this QR code or the link here. Now let's take a closer look. Oh, okay, so we all know that uh, Evergelion is a giant robot powered by electricity cable. So when the cable is broken, that's when the time, I mean the timer start ticking. Because now the, the robot is powered by battery, internal battery, which only lasts for briefly a few minutes. And in the last, okay, 60 seconds, uh, time is running out, so the timer would turn into red color to indicate emergency, and Shinji would start crying from that moment onward, okay? And everything went wrong from, from that point on, okay? Okay, then finally the time ran out, and then the timer stopped at the zero seconds. So that's the free transition of the GUI that I've shown here, uh, from inter uh, sorry, external to internal, from internal to emergency, and then stopped. And by the way, if you want to take like, look at more examples, please uh, check out my another repo, Evergelion Timer and an Analysis. I listed out uh, all, most of the appearance of this timer. And one interesting fact, uh, and another reason why I want to try this is because, uh, you know, Evergelion has been in production for 26 years, right? So there are at least two series of it. Uh, the Neo Genesis Evergelion uh, back in uh, 1997, and then 10 years later, uh, another rebuild series. So even the timer design itself has changed over this long period of time. It probably uh, is showing uh, a different preference of graphical design, because uh, the, perhaps the designer try to catch up with the, the preference of their audience. So uh, in the new timer, uh, you see a, a different color is being used, and a different fonts is being used, which may look like slightly modern, perhaps. Uh, but anyway, the way it is animated is kind of similar. And it's still, uh, like capture uh, my attention a lot. Like another interesting thing in the new review movie, there are like uh, a few more design being revealed when the story progresses. So when uh, when the robot is uh, like in a standby mode, uh, there's an auxiliary mode here, and uh, in the beast mode, there's another completely red timer with glitches and noise. And the most in interesting one that I think is when Asuka we call we call her memory during training. So there's a version of the timer uh, where it's a, a very like, vintage color, and then the language is in German. So you see that I think the design team has spent some decent effort to make this timer uh, look real. Now, uh, uh, apart from me, I think some other people also, also tried to implement this timer on the internet. So if you Google Evergreen Timer, you'll see like, different implementation in the past. Now today we'll do the same, but we'll do it on browsers and using Python, okay? So how do we reproduce those uh, components? Uh, first of all, um, I want to answer the question how we uh, remove the projected transform of this image, because in the anime, uh, the graphic is tilted, like it's a projected view. So to, in order to reconstruct the graphic, I think it's better to uh, remove the projection. 
So it turns out it's a very simple problem, well-studied problem called homography. Basically, by finding the homographic transform, we can transform between the projected and the non-projected view by applying the H or the H inverse. H is the homographic matrix. Now, this is a piece of code in scikit-learn or scikit-image, uh, in case you want to try it later. Basically, we read the image, and then we create four anchor points. We tweak the four anchor points, and you can get a decent estimation of the projective uh, matrix. Then you can apply the inverse. Then what you get is a non-projected version of it. Now, from this part, then we can then build, uh, I mean, analyze those components. And here, I, uh, okay, okay, let's out uh, all the components involved. Now, uh, to start with, perhaps the most eye-catching one is the one, the, back, the background color, which is a gradient color field, uh, consists of red, uh, yellow, and green. And then on top of this gradient background, there are many decorative dots. So this dot is actually a characteristic of Evergreen like anima animation, because in other GUI, in the anime, they all consist of a lot of dots. And then um, one special thing is those panels, it consists of many irregular borders. So this is a nightmare for HTML design, like irregular border. And then um, when it comes to the fonts, uh, I selected three fonts, try to reproduce the original one. Uh, for the Japanese font, I took uh, the Sand Antique, which is publicly available in Google uh, Fonts API. And then for English fonts, I, I think the exact font is the Ario Round MT. And then the, uh, like the old style 77 LCD font is used to show the time. Now, okay, the headache for a developer is how to put these parts in place, like in the correct place, because they're irregular. And then uh, you want to put it precisely in place so that you can reproduce uh, the original feeling. Uh, if you know about uh, some other JS framework, like React, Vue.js, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's not designed for this purpose. Uh, so um, at the beginning, I think it's not feasible. But then later on, I figure out uh, there's one way to do it is the scalable vector graphic. So in case you don't know about this graphical format, this is an image format, but uh, it's not in pixels. It is actually in uh, like, um, it's like a drawing instructions. Basically, you specify drawing instructions, then the browser will then render the, the graph according to your instruction. Here's a simple example. Using uh, SVG, we can instruct the browser to draw a circle with a certain uh, color and the stroke size. Then the browser will render the graphic. So that's how we do uh, uh, the layout of irregular components. And uh, I, I use uh, tools like Adobe Illustrator to draw it. It's very common if you are like designer. I think you, you, you know Adobe Illustrator more than me. And for people who want to try free tools, perhaps Inkscape is another one. And here I want to show you how I did it in Adobe Illustrator. So this is the Adobe Illustrator artboard. Sorry. Now I start with putting the, uh, the image that I uh, uh, prepared earlier by removing the project, projected transform, put it in the background as a guideline, then I start drawing uh, those uh, other vector components on top of it, like those external buttons, uh, and then internal buttons, and then the active time remaining tags, and then I draw the digits, as well as those irregular border. Then I add the dots, decorative dots, and then is the finally is the background. So now we end up have a, like have reproduced almost all the all the graphic. So what you get is something like this in inside of the Illustrator, which is a document uh, that describes the graphic. Uh, then now you can export uh, it as a SVG file and then put it into your website. Um, now one of the beauty of doing so is that. If you put uh, the, the vector graphic versus the original graphic side by side, I think you agree with me that they are almost exactly the same. I mean, there's, there's some difference in the fonts if you are careful enough, but they are like 90% the same. So that's the beauty of using SVG. You can lay out exactly in position what, whatever you want, whatever color. And then another beauty of SVG is that it is scalable. So when you open it on the browser, you can scale it up 
scale it down, whatever size you like, and there are no distortion in the image. So even if you open it on a huge screen, I'm sure you will not have any image quality degrade because this is a vector graphic. Now, uh, before I move on to talk about the programming, uh, one thing to remind, in case you, you're gonna do something similar in the future, make sure when you prepare your SVG file, you organize your element in a logical way. So you group them logically, you name your elements uh, in a consistent name, because this is not just an image. This is actually a, a document that we're going to program later on. So the names and the grouping need to be organized. Then we can program on it. Okay, then move on to the uh, tough part, the coding part. So the whole time it actually like, took me quite some time and a lot of code. So I did, today I cannot cover all of them, but I uh, selected uh, some of the key concepts and I simplified it to show it here. Uh, the code uh, in this section is available in these QR code or in this link is in my GitHub. So you can try, try it together if you like on, on, on this code. Okay. So inside uh, the, the, this folder, I showed some examples. The first one is PyScript, like today's topic. Uh, in case you have not uh, heard about PyScript, uh, PyScript is not a new language. It is just a framework that you can and back into your HTML, and it will run Python script. So how do we do it? Um, let me think, let's do it together. So, um, show you my ID, so. Okay, so this, this is basically the piece of code. Then, uh, now to, uh, what, all you need to do is just prepare an HTML file. Then you add these two lines in your head, header, then it include the PyScript.js and PyScript.css. Now then, uh, you can then uh, start writing your program using this PyScript tag. Like here, I print Hello World, and let's see what we get when we run it. Now see, uh, this is a, okay, let me zoom in. Hello World from PyScript, print from the Python code. So it's very simple. Now, okay, now you can then start to do like your, like, uh, play with it. Like, let's say you want to repeat it 10 times. No, I get repeated 10 times. So that's how easy it is to start a PyScript programming. Just include this header. Then you can start do some Python programming. Um, then we move on to back to what I want to discuss uh, is to use PyScript to manipulate the DOM. But first of all, let me explain what is the DOM. So, so uh, uh, how a browser works actually, you know, when, when you use a browser to go to a certain web page, it will load uh, the HTML file and the CSS file. And those files will be like consuming the memory and construct uh, a tree called DOM tree and CS DOM tree. Basically, that means the document object model and the cascade style sheet object model. So by the browser will combine these two trees to construct the render tree. And the render tree is what is being displayed finally to the user. So as a programmer, basically you can write program to manipulate this DOM tree. Then you can control what's being displayed to the user. And that's what like many JavaScript um, library also do. Um, so now today we'll use PyScript to manipulate this DOM tree. How we do it? Um, okay, let's do it together on here. Now this is uh, an example of how to manipulate DOM tree. This time, uh, apart from the PyScript header, uh, I define an HTML layer in HTML. Let's call it container. Then in the PyScript tag, you can then now import document from the JavaScript, and in the document, you can then use query selector to select the elements that we define. For example, this time we select the container <laughs> element. And what you're given is a pointer, kind of pointer through the HTML element. And then at that point onward, you can manipulate the content of it. For example, here, I'm trying to uh, assign the Python version, uh, output it to the inner HTML. Now let's see what you get. Here, Python version 3.10.2. So this is the uh, Python runtime created by the PyScript. And this version is now embedded into this inner HTML of this layer. And that's how easy it is you can start to manipulate the HTML elements using PyScript. Now, strictly speaking, this is not PyScript. Uh, this part is actually PyODI, so, uh, which is uh, like uh, the, the back end of the PyScript. But anyway, like, it is a way that you can like, call JavaScript functions. Now, based on this uh, 
method, now you can do something more interesting. Um, now the next example I'm going to show is how we lower SVG file. Like using the same method, but this time I prepare a uh, logo, a SVG file logo, and then what I do, I just need to uh, read it uh, using open URL, and then I, I like this return return uh, the text of this file, and then I just assign it to the inner HTML, and that's what you get. So. Uh, a logo embedded directly loaded on the XML. Um, so further on that, uh, what you could do, like you can then start adding some kind of uh, manipulation, like uh, now we can transform the style of it. Uh, for example, here I add a projective transform and rotate the X and C, C axis. Now what you can get from here is now like a projected image uh, with a uh, rotations. Basically, it will drop the browser, will render the transformation according to the spec you put in here. That's how easy it is to further manipulate a SVG. Um, more on that, um, what you can do is here, I prepare uh, animation uh, cascade style sheet, uh, which is a class I call it blank. And by adding, okay, this, this blank is actually a, a animation that repeat infinitely and it is an uh, alternation between visible and invisible. And by up, now the way to do it is that to add this class into the class list of the element. Now then this, uh, this element will then start blanking. So let's see what happened. Now you end up have a logo that like animate according to the cascade style sheet that you define. This time it's a, like flashing or blinking. Um, so using the same concept, um, the there are lots of things you can do. Um, let me show, sorry. Now this is one that you can try on your phone or your browser. So I try to combine them together so you can load your logo uh, dynamically by, uh, uh, on the fly. And then you can do resize of the logo. And you can also change the opacity, that's the transparency of the logo using the style. And you can also do like rotations. And then some more animation, like for example, make it um, breathe like this. And you can change the logo dynamically and make it blank. Or you can make it uh, roll. So basically, you can mix and mash many, many kind of animation onto the SVG file. Now that's how I get it done. In uh, I mean, get the graphic done. And uh, I think another thing is how to uh, make it a buttons in SVG. Okay. Um, now uh, earlier I talked about oh, we need to name the group, uh, name the elements and group it correctly. So this is how we do it. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, this time I want to make one of the SVG element as a button, then the way I do is that I uh, use query selector, select that region or that group, then uh, I add a clickable uh, animation to that group, and then we can register a click uh, event listener. Now, uh, this is very much like a JavaScript way to do it. Uh, it's a, you register a callback function, so when it's being collected, your callback will be, will be invoked. And uh, because this is a, um, like uh, a merge of Python and JavaScript. So you need to use create proxy to warp your callback function because the underneath is actually a JavaScript function is used. So this, this create proxy is a PyoDi thing that you can use to warp your Python function. Now what you get is that uh, now the component uh, will become clickable. And when you click it, the function will be callbacked. Now using this method, you can convert whatever elements in the SVG into a buttons. Um, so that's how most of the basic concept of how to construct the good timer. Now let's move on to one important thing. Okay, finally is how, how the core, core logic work. Uh, here I need to bring on any, uh, another concept which is uh, asynchronous programming. Because uh, I think usually when we learn Python we do asynchronous programming. But when it comes to browser and, and front end, we it's more preferred to use asynchronous. Now, uh, now assume we want to have a certain thread or certain while loop keep running in the background, and then it takes the current system time every 
0.05 second and print the system time on the browser. Then the way to do it in a synchronous mode is that we, uh, you put your while loop inside a function and declare it as async. Now then you can sleep. Uh, you, when you do sleep, you need to use await async IO sleep so that it sleeps a synchronous time. Um, and to start it, you use ensure future to kick it off. Now what you get is uh, without creating another thread, but uh, the asynchronous uh, loop keep going um, by itself and without blocking the main thread. Now, it's quite important that uh, in the front end development in the web browser, we need, need to use asynchronous because otherwise you will block the main thread and make the GUI frozen. So make sure you check out asynchronous programming if you want to do uh, this, this kind of animation. Uh, now, uh, then I do some kind of refactoring because there are too many code. Uh, so in case later on you want to check it out, uh, I refactor it to make it quite easy to create a layer and then easy to load SVG. And then like in just one line, you can convert uh, a certain group into a button and then add a callback to, to that button. Now, uh, okay, after a lot of hard work, that's what uh, it looks like uh, at the end. Um, maybe I can do it together. So, Okay, so here's the outcome. We have a web app that can be loaded on the web browser. Uh, okay, you can do um, start count, count down. You can pause it and then, okay, we can change it to count up. Okay. And we can change it to show system time. Um, and then you can toggle to projective transform. This, this is very easy, just uh, as I explained, just a cascade style sheet clause. And some browsers support full screen, so you can do full screen. And what else? And uh, okay, make it more fun. I add a setting setting page. Now you can change the countdown time to something else, so that okay, like you can count down uh, in a different duration. Okay, and uh, also because this is SVG, very easy to to change the style. You can play around with different style, like grayscale, and then you can show only the wide frame, because it's all just about uh, styling the graphic. And also, uh, so happen I start to create the the new version, the new review GUI. It's, like, um, it's still work in progress. It's not exactly the same, but kind of okay. So that's basically uh, uh, the the outcome of this this project. Uh, so to go back to some of the takeaway I want to explain. Uh, first of all, um, okay, it is a pain to write PyScript in VS Code because uh, the support is quite bad. I mean, there are some uh, extension that you can install. Okay, uh, actually the extension, extension uh, give me some good syntax highlight, which uh, I'm happy. But then it also uh, break some of the native HTML language support. So after I enable the extension, uh, some of the, let's say, even re, uh, formatting a document, the menu is lost. Like live server is lost. So uh, there's some conflict, basically. Uh, perhaps we need to wait for a proper support from VS Code. Uh, uh, so for now, you, you need to uh, like be careful when you write PyScript on, 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 the, I mean on the IDE. And there are no linting. So, so if you write a Python script and then you import PyODI, import JHS, there are no linting. So you are, you are now on your own. No auto-completion. No clock checking, so good luck. Uh, <laughs> and one more in important thing is the perform performance, because I, I also try to implement it in JavaScript. I find it load much faster, and it's much slower in PyScript. Uh, and why? So I try to use, let's say, Lighthouse to analyze the performance of just PyScript Hello World. Look, you know, PyScript Hello World is doing nothing, just load the PyScript. But the performance is, is already quite bad. And the reason being, like, it's, it's loading a huge amount of data in the PyODI back end. And the PyScript itself is taking four seconds to load. So I think this is also a, a well-known problem in, in, um, in the PyScript community. I, hopefully there will be some solution, some improvement later on. Or perhaps when our phone gets faster, this is no longer an issue. Okay. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, conclusion is that, uh, okay, PyScript, and actually PyODI, I should say PyScript and PyODI are fun and easy to learn. And then I think SVG is kind of a hidden germ in web development stack that everyone can try to play with it. It's not very popular, but it allows you to lay out uh, irregular components. Uh, and then 
it can be like added to the DOM tree, then you can style it, you can program it, and you can animate it uh, I mean, along what you want. So it's very flexible. And finally, I think uh, by, even though PyScript had some limitation, but I think combining it with HTML, Cascade Style Sheet, and even SVG give us a lot of other, like many possibilities. Um, so that's, and here are some links, uh, materials that are used today uh, that you can check out later on. Um, and it comes to the Q&A section. Okay, and thank you for uh, listening to the talk. Uh, the time is just right? Yeah. Okay, perfect, okay. Thank you again for the talk. Okay. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and we'll go around. How many time do we have? We have five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, just one moment. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead. <laughs> please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, sorry, can I ask you a uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. It was very interesting and exciting. So I'd like to ask you about the performance. You mentioned the bad performance. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Mention so uh, louder. A bit louder. So. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, thank you for your presentation. And I'd like to ask you about the performance. You mentioned the bad, the reason of the bad performance is loading the uh, PyScript outside of your server, I think. So I, I think so. If you uh, serve the uh, PyScript.js or PyScript.css from your server, the performance got better. Uh, am I right? Or did you try that? Uh, Can you repeat? Uh, try which one? Sorry, the uh, PyScript.js. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the reason of the bad performance is uh -huh. uh, serving the PyScript.js from uh, PyScript.net server. Uh -huh. So if you serve these files from your uh, server, the, I think the performance will get better. Oh, you mean load the PyScript.js from another uh, CDN? Uh, CD, uh, yeah, CDN or I see. you are a local, yeah, you see. are on server. Yeah, maybe I can try it. So far, I, I also tried, actually, the, uh, not just the loading, not just the lo download take time but also the loading of that PyScript oh. runtime take time. Because oh, I, I try, actually I tried to uh, cache, also try to, how to say, that's a w one way that you can download uh, all the PyODI and uh, PyScript.js locally in your, bra in your server. And, and then you serve this PyScript.js and the PyODI from your server. But it seems uh, not a big improvement in my oh. case. Perhaps the load time is uh, also cannot be avoided. Yeah, oh, I see, I see. unless there are some improvement. Ah, oh, got it, thanks, thank you. Okay, any other questions in the front? Hello, uh, yeah, thank you for this amazing talk. So I have a, a few questions. Uh, one of them is that, uh, is it, uh, can we import other like Python third-party library? Although I know uh, it's slow enough, if we import pandas, it might become even slower. So, but yeah, because we are going to play some interesting things, so uh, I'm curious where we can import it. And another question is, uh, where it's production ready? According to its performance, I guess not, uh, but I want to make sure that. So that's the second one. And the third one is that uh, when refreshing this page, uh, it's loading the PyScript. I try to select all the text. Uh, all the text in the browser, and I seem to see the configuration of this page. Is that expected? But does it does it eventually load it? Does it finally load it? Uh, it's finally loaded, oh, but okay. uh, during the loading time, I just randomly tr uh, try to select all the texts and yeah. find out oh, something interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the thing is, yes, uh, when it's loading, it has a splash screen showing the status, and sometimes when your like, internet is really slow, you also see the code display on the screen, so it's quite annoying. So, uh, I mean, I, I didn't figure out how to do it, but maybe there are ways to disable it. I mean, before the, the program really complete the initialization, there's a moment the browser will display the code <laughs> directly, yeah. 
So it happens to some, some of the machine or some of the uh, internet speed is slightly slower. So I, I have, don't have a solution yet, but I think that you can disable the splash screens in Pi, Pi script. So the initial the low loading circle will, will disappear. You can disable the splash screen. Perhaps that will help. Yeah. And then uh, the back to the second question is, uh, sorry, can you repeat this? Uh, where is production ready? Oh, I think according to, the, to them, it's not, read, not for production. It is a uh, beta. So uh, it's his very first attempt to make a complex thing like this. I think usually you check out their tutorials, very simple, hello world examples, and they claim it's still not, in, not for production. And bear in mind, the uh, API will also change. I found that they change the API function names from time to time. So, so if you use it for production, I think, yeah, need to be at your own risk. <laughs> And your first question is? Uh, is it possible to import other third-party library like oh. NumPy or Pandas? Oh, for other libraries, yeah, good question. I think you can import uh, any Python library that is uh, written uh, completely pure Python. So in the PyScript uh, website, you can check out there. They mentioned there are a few common libraries, like I think NumPy and Pandas should be available as well, should be able to load it. But they, I think they port a certain version, which is a pure Python version. Uh, so that it can be low in the browser. But there are many limitations, as you, as you, you may aware. Um, uh, it's lower, and then uh, not all the uh, library can be loaded, only a small amount, um, a certain amount of it. But uh, I think it's good enough for some of the basic uh, testing and trying and learning it. Yeah, yeah but not all. <laughs> yeah, thank you for this amazing talk. Yeah. One more question over there. Uh, I think the time is up. Unfortunately, we have to end the session here. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, first of all, please give a big round of applause for our speaker. Thank you.